Patriots Nation. Stand up. The champs is back. Listen up, this is the anthem track. This is history in the making. You're all witnessing greatness. It's better when the pressure is on us. Our backs against the wall. What we do gets stronger. And everything we earn, we deserve. It's nothing but blood, sweat, tears, and hard work on our turf. Still on top, we stay focused. Been running it for a minute now. If you ain't noticed, cause now is our time. It's all or nothing. So pay attention, cause them boys is up to something. From the proving grounds to top tier, we won't stop, and they still mad, cause we still here. Welcome to the Fox Grow Fellas Podcast. I'm joined by the first ever repeat guest host, Bryson. You may know them on Twitter at Bryson NFL. Uh, today we plan to discuss Bill Belichick's exit, what it means for the Patriots, our thoughts on Mayo, GM search question mark, and the 2024 offseason. Uh, before we get into all that fun stuff, Bryson, uh, how you doing today? How are we feeling? I'm very good. I will have to say I've been on many podcasts from WEI 98.5, a lot of these podcasts. That intro got me going. I was like, you know, it's 530 in the evening. Perhaps I need a coffee. And after I just saw that intro, I'm like, let's go. Except for then I saw Mac Jones. Then I was down again. But then it got better again. So we're eventually going to have to edit that where Mac Jones is not in that. But that's one of the best videos that I've ever seen on an intro podcast for the Patriots. Wow. Thank you very much. And I agree that Mac Jones... (laughs) Needs to exit. Uh, he need, he might need to exit just the territory in general, never mind my intro video. Um, but you're right. Anytime I see Tom Brady fist pump, I get chills. It's just an automatic equation. Tom Brady fist pump plus Pete sees it equals Pete gets chills. That's just how it works. Yeah, I'm with Today? you, man. Like, um, perhaps Mac Jones is actually back next year. Maybe we can talk about that later. But, like... I don't want to see that. <laughs> no, I mean, we can start there. That's fine. Uh, Mac Jones next year, he's under contract. Bailey Zappi under contract. Everyone's thinking that they're going to take a quarterback either in free agency or in the draft. In my opinion, they need to take a quarterback in free agency or the draft. I'm okay with letting the professionals decide which route they want to go, although I like to go young and in in what is quite clearly a rebuild. Um What do you see uh, next year happening at the position, Mac Jones, just your thoughts in general there? Well, you know, I like to, at first it's like, yes, Mac Jones is off my team. And like, that's like a selfish fan thought because I'm also just a fan. Like everyone else is, I'm a Patriots fan. But the thing about it is, is that the Patriots have two veteran quarterbacks under contract. You know, they may get a quarterback in the first round. They may not get a quarterback, but the reality is it's like, the thing I like to do is I always like to go back to how would they see things? Because I'm just a fan. Right. And the the way that I've navigated, over the past five to six years over like really getting into tweeting and things like that is I always like having the perspective how was so and so thinking and why and what would they do differently and I always think I really do believe that if it were up to Bill Belichick Mac Jones wouldn't be on the Patriots going into this season and there was rumors that Mac Jones was perhaps on the trade block back in the spring and there was really no takers and obviously Bill benched him like a million times and they kept going back to him. But Kraft, Mac Jones, Jonathan, they all like each other. There's a there's a fresh start within the Patriots. And if you've listened to what Mike Reese has said in his mailbag, which you know, Mike is never usually the first one to break news or anything like that. But if he says something, then, you know, it's probably true or it's mm. it's he's talked to several people about it. He doesn't usually just make comments. And the thing about what he said is that they they may believe that like Tua, which, by the way, I don't think Tua is very good. Right. We can skip that over. But like Tua, the Patriots may think that a fresh start is needed for Mac Jones because uh, he does have a couple more years left and then his, his fifth year option. So just as a pure value play, what are you really going to get from Mac Jones versus what, what if you just keep him? Because it's, a, it's, he doesn't have to worry about Bill Belichick being there anymore. So like that Bill versus Mac, whatever you think about both of them, 100% was a thing because Mac was crying to Orlovsky and Mac was crying about Patricia. So like, if you look at it from that angle, the crafts did by getting rid of Bill Belichick and only Bill Belichick, by the way, basically they have signaled to me like a casual fan narrative, which may be correct by the way, which is that 
well, Bell, Bill didn't do right by Mac. He can still be a good quarterback. And I'm not saying that like that is the plan. I'm just saying that I think that it, they may go into the draft thinking, okay, we're going to have the best draft that we possibly can. If we draft, if we draft Marvin Harrison Jr. at three and we build our team, we can slide in Mac Jones. He's shown to be really not that bad of a quarterback when he's on his game and we surround him with things that we like. And maybe we can set ourselves up similar to the way the Chiefs did when they had Alex Smith. And then they eventually got Patrick Mahomes. They built a team and then they got Patrick Mahomes. So while if you're not really a Mac Jones fan, I would see it like in that light. Build the team, then get the quarterback you really, really love. Because I don't think they really love Mac Jones, but I just think they know that Mac is probably better than what has been advertised. Now, whether I agree with that or not, I don't like it doesn't really matter what I think, but as far as what they would do, I think they would be very open to that. I 100% agree with you had one thought in there where you were saying, uh, you know, Mac isn't really Bill's guy. They were looking to trade Bill. You know, he got benched four times. If you read the uh, the Wickersham hit piece, um, he's talking about Belichick floating the idea out before this season even started saying we should trade Mac Jones and go in a different direction at quarterback. And that craft stepped in and said, that's not happening. And we had talked about it in the middle of the season via tweets on the, on the last time you were on that Belichick kind of hung Mac out to dry and like said, look at this piece of crap quarterback that we have. This is who I was told to start. This is the guy I wasn't allowed to trade, um, which kind of created a lot of dysfunction in the in, in the clubhouse, I guess you could say, in the locker room, probably better said for football. Um, but yeah, no, Mac Jones shouldn't have been on this team for a lot of last year if Belichick had his way. Kraft overruled him. I wouldn't be surprised if they try to increase Mac's value before they get rid of him. I don't think that they're going to run the 2024 season with Mac Jones. I just think maybe they're almost done with the experiment, but again, maybe want a return on their investment. I would love to see a new... A, something new at quarterback. I don't think it's working here with Mac Jones. I don't think it's working here with Bailey Zappi. And I think that it's time to move in a different direction. And uh, Mac Jones can be one of their plans. Uh, you were talking about how maybe you don't necessarily agree with it, but it might be what they're thinking of doing. Um, you know, Belichick didn't give Mac, Mac a fair run and let's give him a fair run. That piece of crap season with the defensive coordinator as offensive coordinator and then last year with bill hanging him out to dry he never really got a chance let's give him a chance i could see that being on like if they were creating lists of options it would be on their lists of options it wouldn't be the one that i would want them to pick though but i could understand if they were if they were considering it um because like you said uh I don't think Kraft, who's now basically in control, thought that Mac Jones got a fair shot. And he tried to bring him in just like he brought Brady and bring him into his house and have him join his family, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Like, there's no doubt that the Krafts love Mac. I mean, this is the reason why they – you can think, well, you know, it's just because Patricia's a dummy – and that's the reason why Kraft stepped in, but that's not the only reason. Like mm -mm. Kraft stepped in because he really does like Mac, and he wanted to have he wanted to have little hand and someone that Bill would probably agree upon, which is Bill O'Brien, so that Mac would look much better this year. I mean, that's re that's really not unreasonable thing. I I don't think that they love Mac Jones like they think he's the greatest quarterback ever. Even the casual if you go with the casual narrative, right? The casual narrative, which is what I think most owners are operating under. Most most owners, most people in general are operating under the narrative, which is very casual. Which is that Mac look, you know, was supposed to be this good prospect coming out of the draft and he was he had a good really good first year and then matt patricia came in and then you know we tried to hire bill o'brien and get things going again but it just didn't really work out bill benched him mac was complaining let's clean slate it for everyone and if we get a quarterback that'd be really awesome but if we didn't get a quarterback maybe we should build the team and fall back upon mac and see how he does and if he, if he doesn't do all right, maybe we've drafted another quarterback and we insert him and then the Mac Jones experience is over. And you can fully do that because fans would be, um, they'd be completely in support of that, too. So it really it doesn't re it's it's not going to hurt either side too much. But if they move on with them, they, they could do that, too. I just think that if they don't get a quarterback or if they if they don't get a quarterback, they're going to keep Mac around. Like, I don't think they're going to keep Zappy around. He already signed with Clutch Sports. They cut him last year. I don't know. It's a weird situation. I don't think you can keep Mac and Zappy again.
No, it would be interesting though if if that was their like if they were coming down the plans. I mean, the veteran quarterback market is basically Kirk Cousins or Baker Mayfield, and Baker Mayfield probably is going to get his talents retained after his big win. Um, so it's really Kirk Cousins. And if you're if you're looking at the Patriots, like are we going to sign Kirk Cousins to add him with Zappy to add him with Jones, who are all under contract? They're going to have to get cut or traded, right? If they're not going to be on the roster next year, so. Instead of going veteran quarterback, I could see them making a business move and going, we're just going to stick with Mac and see what he can do. Especially if you get like a, a Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Especially if you get a, a stud wide receiver and you're like, let's run it back with with, uh, the, with an offense that we fully gave the keys to the offensive coordinator, whoever that may be, Bill O'Brien, somebody else, maybe Josh McDaniels, who we had success with. There's so many names floating around and so many different things um, that are happening that it's just so hard to predict. And I mean, uh, MC is right. Kirk Cousins doesn't leave Minnesota in his opinion. He might not. If Kurt doesn't leave and Baker doesn't leave, it's like Ryan Tannehill and a bunch of other crap names at quarterback and the veteran free agency. So there's like no one good. It's basically stick with Mac and Bailey Zappi or draft a quarterback in the, in the, uh, in the draft. It's kind of where they're almost getting pigeonholed into. Um, I don't necessarily know if they even want Mac as their best option, but, I think you're right. They're just going to go out and have the best draft they can possibly have. It might be one of the things that Mayo learned from Belichick in his time was to pick the best players and not necessarily focus as much on like what you need because rookies often don't have a major impact on your need for the next year. They kind of are more of a growth plan. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how Mayo drafts or how the GM drafts or how the combination of people picking draft. Uh, I mean, they just have so much going on. Um, over and like who's doing what, like what the org chart is in the Patriots is wild right now. Um, the GM mm -hmm. search, I put search question mark because it's like, is it a search or is it more just running with what we have? I mean, they got grow and wolf and that's who you think is going to make the decisions until there's a change. But, uh, a lot of people are thinking outside hire. Some people are thinking that some people are no hire or where, where do you stand on this GM search? I think I've said this on Twitter a couple of times for a year, or we could call it, I'm going to call it a football year, which is not really a year. They've known that they're going to eventually promote Gerard Mayo to head coach. We all know that mm. by now. So they've had this little plan to just slide Mayo in. And it just so happens that the Patriots had a really bad year. So that kind of made it easier for Bill and Bill and the Patriots to go their separate ways and to slide Mayo in there. And if you notice, like the infrastructure around the Patriots is in general, like the same. And so that to me means they're going to keep most of everything else the same. You know, there's Matt Groves there. There's some other people there. Like they're going to, I believe that they will remain there and they're going to, as for the rest of the positions, like they'll, they'll say in air quotes, we're doing our due diligence and they're going to keep basically everything around because the narrative surrounding the organization is bill has his hands in this and he has his hands in this and he didn't let us do this and he didn't let us do this which like i always think when things are going really bad that's what people always tend to do is armchair every decision someone has ever made like oh he didn't let me do this and if it was up to me i would have done this and as if things would be much better if you did everything your way but i digress but either way i think that's what they're doing right they i think the crafts they kind of wanted their football team back right they wanted Bill out of there and Mayo in there, someone that they can really have a hand in doing what they want. And maybe that not even necessarily be like picking a player or doing this, but just having more influence and more say within the franchise because it's going to be, they know it's going to be transitioned into Jonathan's team anyway. And if you believe the things like the dynasty and stuff like that, the idea is that Jonathan, you could see him as a classical Brady stand, whereas he is team Brady and doesn't really care too much for Bill. And I think most people kind of know that. Whereas it's a little bit different. Yeah. It's a little bit different with Robert, right? He has more of a professional relationship with Bill, but that we're transitioning, which is what people are not talking about. We're transitioning into the Jonathan Kraft era and Jonathan and Robert Kraft love Gerard Mayo. So they're going to do their air quotes, due diligence, and they're going to keep basically everything, everything the same. And maybe next year they get a new GM or things like that. I just think that if you have, like, it's not normal to have a head coach 
and then have a GM. Normally, the GM and the head coach they come as like a duo, like Shanahan and John Lynch. Package. They came they're they're a package duo, right? The GM searches for the head coach who they they have the same ideas. Well, they already have that in Foxborough. Everyone is basically aligned in Foxborough. Um, if you're if you're taking the positive spin of this, that's kind of a good thing. You want everyone to have like the same alignment, the same outlook, the same everything. And with Bill being gone, they have that. Like like it or not, they, like Mayo thinks one way, the Crafts are thinking one way. Everyone's full speed ahead in this one way. Which every time I get pessimistic about the Patriots, which there's a lot of reasons to be, that gives me some hope. And I wrote about that. That gives me hope is that they do have a full steam ahead thing. But as for GM, I don't think much is going to change. I just think that they're going to – like more people are going to be allowed to do what they do, and we'll see what happens. It is interesting. You were talking about continuity, that it's going to be all kind of an aligned vision in New England, or that's at least what we hope with the change, whereas Belichick and Kraft didn't really have an aligned vision. In fact, they couldn't be more on separate pages, it seemed like. Um, quick, did you get a chance to read Seth Wickersham's? I'm going to call it a, a hit piece. That's just because everyone else is calling it. I just kind of call it factual reporting. Uh, did you get a chance to read the nitty gritties? Yeah, I read it. And, you know, back in the day when they did the first one with Jimmy G, like people have said the same thing and a lot of that stuff came out to be true. Some yeah. of the details we're not really certain about, but like sure. reporters like this, they're not going to really just release stuff unless several people are saying it. So like most of the stuff is probably true, I would guess. I don't know. Yeah, no, it seems like they took time to go to a couple different sources or to have a, you know, some sort of verification or someone close to the person before they express the person's thoughts. But they also, ex they did a good job of showing both sides. They like made a good case for why Bill should be pissed. They made a good case for why Kraft should be pissed. And honestly, I got like a, a a fan type of emotional while reading it. It kind of just felt like we had such good times, man. And now it's like all complicated and they had a breakup. It was like this relationship that was just so good when it was good. And now it's just so volatile that it's bad. And it, it's a, it was kind of upsetting to read in, in some ways, but I tried not to be emotional, tried to stay objective. There was a couple things that came out of it. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase uh, some of the things that, that were said and, and just kind of get some takes on it. Um, but one of the things I thought, you know, how you were talking about Jonathan and Belichick probably didn't like each other, but Kraft liked them a little bit more. It almost seemed like this article was suggesting towards the end, it kind of got like F it type uh, mentality out of Kraft. He was like, I'm done with this. Um, and he was over it, uh, I think is a good way of saying it. He used to call Belichick and he denied it. But in the hit piece, it said there's just so many times that he said this phrase that it's just undeniable at this point. Like that's pr doubling down as a reporter. He used to call Belichick the great intelligent man in a sarcastic way, you know, basically saying like, oh, yeah, move on from Brady, the great intelligent man, draft Jimmy Garoppolo because quarterbacks decline in their 30s. Great intelligent man, like mocking his quarterback behind or mocking his head coach behind his back, which it kind of that's not good uh, I <laughs> at all. I don't it's just not a great way to treat your employees. Um they were businesslike and distant. They said the two men were in an unhappy marriage, but couldn't afford a divorce. Um, and that's, I think, a great way of describing it. Uh, they just kind of found a little bit of disdain for each other um, as the season went along. And a lot of people said that the Germany game was the one that did it. I think that's just when the the straw that broke the camel's back. What the hell? I don't know if I'm saying or quoting it right. Basically, that was it. That was when enough was enough. Um, but to be quoting or to be calling your head coach, the great intelligent man, sarcastically behind your back, things got bad between them. Yeah. I would also like, uh, now that I've positively spun it and I've heard what you just said about craft, let's like just separate how I feel, how we feel. Let's, let's take this perspective. So let's think of it as an outside NFL fan. So you're Robert Kraft. You make fun of your head coach behind his back. You think for years, he's probably made some bad decisions and I'll maybe let's grant him that he's made some bad choices. He might be right. Yeah. Brand Brady out. Let's grant him all. Let's grant him the worst thing he could ever say about Bill Belichick. Right. Yeah. I will say since 2013, people have been calling Mayo like Bill Belichick's son around the team. And I know my buddy Patriot seventh ring tweeted that back then even and so Mayo is like this, he's built this foundation from Bill Belichick. So now let's, let's say it out loud. So you're mad and fired the coach 
that you didn't think was very good anymore and you routinely made fun of him after four years of him not being very good. Okay. The solution to you find firing the coach that you didn't think was very good anymore and ran your quarterback out was that you hired the coach that worked under the coach that you just fired that you thought wasn't that good anymore. And that doesn't really sound like I am going to give Mayo a chance and I'm like, I'm full fan ahead. Like I'm ready to go and I'll, I'll spin it every positive way I can. But if you just say that out loud, it really doesn't make sense. And it makes you actually look not very smart when you're making fun of someone heavily. And then you sign or you, you elevate the person that learned directly below them. It's like, do you not think that like, I realize Mayo is a different person than Bill is and they probably, and you know what? To spin it the other way, the best thing about wisdom is that you can take ideas from the past and modernize them and make them into much better ideas. That's called syncretism. I totally get it. But if you say it out loud, Kraft, and you're making fun of Bill behind his back, it doesn't. It sounds silly to hire the coach below the coach you just fired. So I like, hear you. To, so that's I would say that's the like, negative aspect. And then we could say, well, to add on to that. If we spin it that way, the Patriots are probably – they probably don't really understand why they won, and they believe it's their culture, they believe it's this, and they believe it's that. And I believe they think that they've created this thing that is the Patriot way where it's it's not really the Patriot way, and it's some other way that includes probably – um, whatever percent Brady and whatever percent Bill, both of those guys aren't there anymore. And by the way, and Ernie Adams isn't there anymore. Dante, Dante Scarnecchia isn't there anymore. Like this, the Bill, Brady, Dante, Ernie, these are like four of the greatest minds in NFL history, and they're no longer with the Patriots. And that brain drain should not be really overlooked, and I think that's why they've struggled over the last couple of years. And if the Patriots think that they can just – like redo that and run it back and that their culture that they created matters like much more than that. And we'll, we'll just recreate this thing everywhere else. Guess what has happened with every other team in the NFL when they tried to recreate the Patriots in other places, bad things everywhere. Josh McDaniels, bad Patricia, bad, like the list get on, on, on. And you might say, well, mayor is different. Okay. Guess what? I'm going to grant him that I'll give him a chance, but it, I think that the Patriots don't really know why they were so good. And it was that initial reaching out to Bill Belichick, creating this thing with Tom Brady, that a a whole new thing that created what was the Patriot way. Now they're trying to redo that. And it's like getting back with an old girlfriend again. Like to me, it's just, I don't know. We'll see. But I'm just laying the foundation for why you could say it it might not work. I hear you. Uh, MC agrees with you. hundred percent correct is what he says. Um, Why would you want to elevate the junior version of the person that you openly mocked um, and were basically (laughs) making fun of that? It's a very good point, right? Like why it's like, so you just want him again? Like you just fired him. Why wouldn't you just fire Mayo? He's basically the same guy. I think that they don't necessarily think of him as the same guy. They don't think of him as this old crusty guy who believes he's the shit. Mayo, it has to be humble. He's wildly inexperienced. He's got like five years coaching experience. Um, so he, he can be controlled. Kraft felt out of control. Um, early on in the days of the Patriots, he had that, like in the 2001, 2002, he had the, the kind of the rumor or the, I don't know what the right word is I'm looking for here, but people thought that he meddled, um, was kind of like what the rumor was. Um, and so he had Belichick called him into his office, said, what, you know, what are your thoughts? Belichick had like a way too much information. He narrowed it out on him and Kraft was like, all right, you're in control of everything. And basically that was how it was for like 15 years. Right. And so now Kraft is like, I want a little bit more control. I own this team. I have every right. Jonathan, like you said, is coming in and we have every right to have a say in some of this stuff. And I feel like they can control Mayo. So they're like, we're going to replace the guy we can't control with the guy we can't control and still keep the brilliance of what we think was the coaching scheme. Obviously I think some of the great brilliant man comment was more about personnel. Um, And again, now they have, control over their personnel they can go to their personnel and tell them what they want um and they'll probably do it uh so i think control is a little bit of the of the thing that they were firing is they wanted to fire some control um and then the other thing you said was like the the brain trust has went away and that was another thing that wickersham talked about in his article he he kept using the word erosion or eroded and i thought that's a great word what they had slowly eroded 
Um, they had the Patriot way and that slowly went away before each coaching division used to trust in what the game plan was. Belichick would say, I want you to figure out a way to take away their best wide receiver. And the defensive team would go then study and figure out how to do that. Right. Um, I, they don't, they didn't agree anymore. Belichick would say, go do it. And they would argue, you know, there would be arguments behind, behind the scenes. So I think some of what was functioning er eroded. And I think that's a great way, great way of putting it. Um, but that, that would be my counter to why would you hire the junior version, more control, you still get the same game plan and you get more control of the personnel. Um, I, I don't know that, that, that would be my counter there, there to that. Um, well, I think you're right, and like that's totally up to them. They're the owners. I would be playing Madden in real life, and I would have so much control over everything if I was the owner of a team and a massive billionaire, right? So I totally get it. I'm not blaming them or anything like that. And also, I know you're just getting ready to read the comment. Like, Mayo is not the same as Bill. Let's not get it twisted. I'm just simply saying that neither was Josh McDaniels, neither was Matt Patricia. Like, neither, mm. like everyone is different in their own ways. But if I'm mentoring you, what is the percentage is that you are me and like if you're going through a hard time how often are you going to think man what would bill do and is that a good thing is that a bad thing how do you weigh that how does craft weigh that because i almost feel like if mayo is in if mayo is in trouble or he's like he's going to call bill and bill's going to know he can call him maybe i don't know we'll i mean we'll see about that i guess but it just feels like if you meant if you've mentored someone like they're going to take on like the majority of your personality well i mean we'll see mayo seems like a different guy but everyone says that i'm interested to see it and i'm excited and i'm ready for the next era of football i'm just saying there's reasons also doubt that it will be great I mean, uh, one of the things that you were talking about having him call Bill uh, with Wickersham commented on this. He said the relationship was strained and that because basically after Germany and Belichick kind of got the message that he's gone, it made it a weird environment that everyone knew Mayo was the replacement and that. So like the boss and the person below him, everyone knew the person below him was about to kick the boss out. But you can, if you can think of just like going to work and knowing that your boss is about to get overrun by someone that's like your peer, that's a little weird. And especially if you're like a player playing for him, knowing like, should I listen to Mayo or should I listen to Bill? Mayo is about to be the guy, it feels like. So it definitely created a weird vibe at work. Um, and I wonder how that affects the moving forward. Maybe he can't call him because Bill's the head coach of another team and there's just, that's a boundary. But maybe it didn't end as, as night. Nice. You know, there's more to find out. I think about this story than, than what we know right now and what Wickersham has reported, but he did add some, some hot takes in that, uh, in that article. Uh, let's see what Justin's saying here. That's what Jonathan's doing. He is the GM. He didn't like Bill getting his way. Yep. I mean, Jonathan and Bill like don't talk, didn't talk to each other. Like they wouldn't even acknowledge <laughs> each other's presence if they were around each other. And towards the end, if you watched, Kraft and Belichick on the field at the Jets game, they didn't look at each other either. So like it got a little testy there at the end. And I think it's well documented that uh, Jonathan and, and Kraft, I mean, sorry, Jonathan Kraft and Belichick just we weren't fans of each other. If they're going to run it back with Mac Jones, I'd be shocked if they get a quarterback. I mean, if the plan is to go back with Mac Jones, I would hope that they still take a chance on like a late round quarterback or just some young quarterback to have options or backup plans or like hope as opposed to just putting all your eggs in one basket. I really, really can't, uh, I really can't, you know, say that let's just roll it back with Mac Jones and that's it. That's the plan. There's no backup plan. I really hope that's not it. And absolutely well, like, MC. I can't go ahead. Oh, sorry, man. I didn't mean to interrupt you at all. That's one. No, of I went on to like, before. I went on to like my fourth <laughs> thought. So you, you I, my, my <laughs> fault for rambling. <laughs> no, no, you're completely good. I, I just thought you were done. And I was going to say, I have two comments. And the first one, I like to pin that conversation about the quarterback because I can give us a scenario and I have a little something to, to say about that. Um, let's talk about that first, actually. So um, I, well, I don't know how to say this. Um, I don't really do much reporting anymore. Um, I used hmm. to do that and I don't really do that. If you notice, if you're on my spaces or things like that, there, there's stuff that I still will hear. And I'll say like, if you're in my spaces and everyone can vouch before the Germany game, I said that it would get weird if they lost this game. And that was before like everything started to, to navigate. And I said, I think if they lose, they, the crafts will seriously look for places where Bill could go. Now, obviously that's up to Bill, right? But every once in a while I get a little, I get a little nugget and like that just happens being in the space that I'm in. I see what people say. And um, I will just say that the number one pick is for sale. 
Um, the Bears just interviewed Greg Roman, who is a Cam Newton guy, a Colin Kaepernick guy, obviously a Omar Jackson guy. And Justin Fields is popular in a way that we don't really quite understand here in Chicago. I have some friends that are Bears fans. Like Justin Fields, it's, it's insane how popular is, which I get it. He's a dynamic player. He's exciting. He was a he was a top pick, like he was a top like kind of a Mac Jones pick, but like more electric in that draft. Like they were very excited for him and stuff like that. But they have the they're in the situation again where they have the number one pick, and you have Caleb Williams coming out. You have Drake May, and those really their two options, right? And I think that. What they're what they are looking to do is sell the number one pick, and ideally, I think Caleb Williams wants to be a commander. I'm, I'm hinting at this because I've heard this from one person, Caleb. Uh, the commanders have been given, and sh- the commanders have instructed their GM and everyone else, like, if we can get Caleb, get Caleb. And I've been told that there have been some talks already about that, and I think that's why Caleb took so long to declare, too. By the way. But at number one, I think that there's a good chance the commanders trade up because number one is going to be a quarterback and number two is going to be a quarterback. So, like, I don't think num- they're, the Bears are not going to draft Marvin Harrison Jr. number one. I think number one picks for sale. And ideally, what the Bears would do is trade number one and number two because the Patriots could get a quarterback and slide to number three and just take the guy they wanted to at one and then get a haul for both of those picks. Like that's insane, but that's the position they're in because of Drake May and Caleb Williams. Now I think those are the, those are the clear cut best quarterbacks in the draft. As of right now, I think May is, has a clear edge on Williams. People disagree about that. Right. But I think that the bears, there is a route for the Patriots to get from three to one or potentially three to two because the commanders may trade up and the bears are going to be open to trading both of those picks if that does happen. So if you're the Patriots, look, I will, I will always say, if you can be aggressive, go up and get the guy. I will never care about those future picks because like there may never, I know people will say like, Oh, you don't need a first round quarterback. Like you don't like, I'm totally for being aggressive for the quarterback that you like, but the same way the chiefs were with Mahomes. They liked them. They traded up. They didn't trade up the number one. They still were able to trade up and get him. Like, I think Drake may is that guy. And I, and for that matter, like if Caleb's there, I would consider that too. But I think the Patriots should trade up to number one, grab their quarterback and forget about it later. Like there clearly there's going to be a lot of uh, building with the team, a lot of things you're going to need to do. But we watched these last couple of years of the Patriots drafting in the first round. And if you look at other teams in the first round, like Nikhil Harry, um, like I'm going to argue, I'm going to get into argument about this, but Sonny Michelle, Isaiah Wynn, like all, like all these players that just, they turned out to be marginal starters or they didn't play too long in the league or they weren't very good. Like you will, it's rare to get an impact first round pick that just starts for your team and is an hall of fame player. Like with these picks, all you're doing is collecting assets to grab players that start for your team, right? And the draft doesn't end after the first round. So theoretically, the Patriots could just have good drafts and good off seasons and just sign the continuation of their players. And quarterback is still the most important position. Now, if they can get a great if they can get a great offense going, like a great scheme, uh, be a team that is one of those teams with a great scheme, which I don't know, we've seen the Patriots scheme. It's not really a replicable like scheme over the NFL, but if I think the the route for the Patriots is trade up to one or two, depending on what happens, because the Bears are going to be open to one or two. The, the, those picks are going to be for sale. Get a quarterback, forget about it. And if not, maybe you just draft Marvin Harrison Jr. at three. Maybe you just trade out and draft neighbors and another pick for next year. I don't know. I'm just laying the foundation for all of this. You were saying that the number one picks up for sale and that the commanders really want Caleb Williams, so they would have to – trade up to get Caleb Williams, but if Chicago with the first pick likes fields or doesn't trades fields, then Washington could stay put in the, you know, and assume that Chicago is not going to double up on quarterback. So I wonder if it's a lot of wait and see here uh, before anyone kind of pulls a trigger. And once it does, once a trigger gets pulled, it's going to, it feels like it's going to be a domino effect of what is going to happen. Who's going to jump ahead of who, because you're right at the three position if it goes quarterback, quarterback, and you're the Patriots at three, you don't get one of those top two quarterbacks. If they're assessing the talent the same way that we're assessing the talent, you know, saying that it's Williams and May, and that some might say Daniels is the one, and that they're happy to be at three because they can get the guy they want, the third quarterback. So there's a lot going on there. Um, But 
why would Chicago want to move on for Fields if they're so in love with them? Are they? Is it like the Patriots camp where it's kind of a 50-50 split, or, or where do you see that? No, I think they like him. I think that's why they're bringing in Greg Roman. They want to. They want to try to build a team around Fields and see if they can, see if they can continue with him because he's still a cheap option. Bringing Greg Roman, he did wonders for Lamar Jackson and other quarterbacks previously. Uh, maybe draft Marvin Harrison Jr. Trade for other picks, get another haul. And if if you, mm. they're thinking like well, we can just swing with Fields and have elite talent, and next year we could draft a quarterback, or the next year we could draft the quarterback, right? Because they right. maybe they produce this amazing haul for one and two. So I think the Greg, like if you're gonna if you're gonna interview Greg Roman, you're either like you're smoke signaling to holy hell, or you're just going to keep Justin Fields, right? Because I don't think you keep Greg Roman if you're Caleb Williams. I don't think you do it if you're Drake May either. This is a Justin Fields hire, right? So I think they're like, okay, how do we fix Fields? Okay, we fix Fields, but if you were going to do that, Greg Roman is the guy to right. do that with. And you're right. A smoke signal is a perfect word for it. There's so many people being brought in for interviews for pure smoke signal. You know, like just to send, hey, look at what we're doing, or look where you can start thinking that we're doing this because of look at who we're bringing in. Like yeah, the you Falcons right bringing too. in, you know, like the Falcons bringing in Belichick. Like, are, are they actually hiring him, or are they showing the rest of the league that we're taking it? Are they showing their fans we're taking it serious? You you never know what the intent is behind everything. Like you said, Greg Roman makes sense for Fields. Uh, that seems like I, I'm with you on that one. That hire would mean Fields. And that would mean trading the number one pick. In my opinion, you brought up if it was a Madden franchise and I was a billionaire, I would do X, Y, and Z. Well, if I was Chicago and I had the first overall pick and everyone wants a quarterback and I'm going to stick with my quarterback, like that's what I'm rolling into this. I'm trading that pick. I'm going down because I think I can get, if I want Harrison, I can trade with the Patriots and just go down a couple spots and probably get a bunch of more good players. Building assets is what you do when you're trying to build a team. So yeah, I would. I could even drop down maybe you can create a little competition uh oh patriots you want them well i heard that the the titans might be looking for a quarterback so i'm gonna actually talk about seven with them too i know three versus seven but if they think they can pick a player that's fine at seven then why not move down a little bit more and get even a bigger haul because when you go from seven to one that's a bigger leap than when you go from three to one so team might be willing to pay more for a larger leap you know so it might be advantageous for them to go a little bit further down in the first round to see who wants to jump up X number of picks because they can sell it for a higher price. So there's a lot going on in the draft and there's a lot of dominoes to fall here. Um, but drafting a quarterback in the first round, I think is pivotal. Um, someone sent me this. Um, they said they showed every quarterback and where they were picked. That's currently in the playoffs and every quarterback that's in the playoffs outside of Brock Purdy who was picked in the seventh round is a first round pick. Um, Lots of talent in the first round. It doesn't need to be top 10. I talked about this in my uh, do we tank or not special about how the, the best quarterbacks actually get picked outside of like the top three, top five. Like there's not too many top three, top five quarterbacks that actually have been pretty success, you know, successful. It's usually further down, which I don't think makes any, it doesn't mean much, you know, but it's just still an interesting fact, right? You just still want to pick the best quarterback that you evaluate. And if you're picking at three, that's where you pick, right? Um, but it is interesting that all the quarterbacks in the playoffs are first round picks. Uh, you know, talent finds itself in the first round at the quarterback position. So I, I would presume that if you're looking for a quarterback, you're you're fighting for one of those top three selections. If you like Daniels too, on top of all of that. I think it's funny that you mentioned that because I won't talk too much about the draft. I'm not very good at scouting college players i've already told you that i don't have time i i right. mostly defer to other people and then like there'll maybe five to ten players that i'm like i really like these guys and these are the guys i like but i will say about daniels over the course of the next couple months whether you like him whether you don't like him he's tall lamar jackson's in the playoffs like he's a comparable player to him over the next couple months, he's got a good deep ball. He's fast. He has good highlights. Like he's right there with everything every casual team would want. He is going to skyrocket, right? His draft stock is going to completely rise. And I will make a prediction on this podcast that by March we will be having conversations. And I, by the way, I've already um, said to this my to my other friend, friends of other NFL teams. Like I'm going to start this narrative, so we're going to have conversations. And I'm just saying it won't be me. Jaden Daniels 
or Caleb Williams? Who is actually better? Because USC always produces these good quarterbacks. They have an extremely good system. You can you saw Caleb's backup come in. Like they're gonna people are gonna have these arguments about is Jaden Daniels better than Caleb Williams? So his draft stock is also gonna skyrocket, I think, which leads into the funnel that is the Patriots have the number three pick. If they're they don't like Jaden Daniels so much, maybe they don't they're not able to trade up. They can't get Mayor Williams. Maybe there's a team that wants to trade up for Marvin Harrison Jr., which is completely likely and more like like if there was a receiver to ever trade up for, it is Marvin Harrison Jr. And I think that Dan, Jane, Jane and Daniels is going to enter that conversation too, right? So I think that at the end of the day, the Patriots sitting at three is going to become over this next period months of hype talk. This is going to become a very valuable pick to have while we – because we're Patriots fans and we're constantly looking at everyone else like, oh man, it'd be nice to have one or two. Whereas actually throughout the draft, there's teams right now, they're sitting in their room thinking, I cannot believe we don't have the number three pick. Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to is gonna go to three. We have to get to number three. We have Justin Herbert. We need to get Marvin Harrison Jr. And yeah, Malik Neighbors is good. He's there too. I like him a whole lot. But Marvin Harrison Jr. is a completely different level of prospect and hype to the experts and to the casual fans. So this is the this is the draft where I think another, the Patriots may be very lucky to have the three pick because teams are going to fall in love with Jaden Daniels and Marvin Harrison Jr. So maybe there's a world where they get the trade back a couple picks, they get neighbors, they get all one of these other good players, and people are going to be mad at that, by the way, but this might be a good draft to trade back if you can because people are going to love this number three pick. It's just, I think the count, the other side of that is trade back and get what? Um, you know, I'm down to trade back. I always am. And like you said, running a Madden franchise, I love collecting picks because they're just worth stuff and you can get, you can trade picks for players that are established, whereas when you're picking a, a pick, turns into a player. So if you know who you're likely going to pick with your, with your selection, you know who you're trading almost like, so in your third round pick, if we didn't trade and it went Caleb Williams, Drake may, we would pick Jaden Daniels or Marvin Harrison. So you can think of what I trade Jaden Daniels or Marvin Harrison for. It's easy to put it into an equation. Once you realize the pick is just going to be a player at the end of the day. So you could think my fifth round pick, I'm going to go with some linebacker that might be a depth. But I trade a depth linebacker for, you know, you can kind of figure out how you can assess your draft pick. So it is going to be interesting to see what the Patriots think their value is out of their pick and what player they want. And if they're still available at three and they think they're going to be available at six and the Giants want to move up three spots, then maybe they do move down. Um, I think trading down has been Belichick's strategy because he just realizes people are willing to overpay in a moment for what's on the table in front of them and trading on draft day uh, has always been a huge, you know, he's been a huge fan and a huge proponent of trading on draft day. So he's been doing something right and, and plenty of things wrong, but I think that's one of the things he does right is capitalize on other people's wants and needs and on draft day when he thinks he can, uh, you know, I keep talking about Bill, like the memories, but you know, that's not a bad strategy at the end of the day is, is to rely on picking, uh, you know, the best player at the spot. And if someone wants to overpay for the spot, sell the spot for, for more than its value, I think that that would be wise. And I think there are going to be some trades, especially with quarterbacks being in the top eight or so. I mean, you look at Chicago with Fields, you got the commanders, they could be in need for a quarterback. Patriots are. Arizona, they have a quarterback. Chargers, quarterback. Giants, quarterback. Titans could use one. And Atlanta could use one. And then you're back to Chicago again. So you do have like three teams sprinkled into that top uh, well, I left one team out of the top ten, and then the, and then I the think Jets. The Vikings that, we're really gonna have to look at. They've been super aggressive in the last couple of years too. We're we're really gonna have to watch the Vikings too in this draft, and what they do in free agency. Because I mean, they have Dobbs and Cousins in free agency. So if they let both of them go, you're almost for sure gonna be picking a quarterback or moving up to pick a quarterback. But they're in the eleventh pick, I think. Right? Yeah, right behind the Jets. And to what you just said about Belichick, I'm not sure how many people know this, but he was the godfather of uh, creating the chart for trade value. I'm not sure if you know yep. this. So, oh, yeah. like, he, he literally founded the first wave of analytics where, he like, for this seventh-round pick is worth this pick, this pick, according to such and such chart. And that's why he talks exactly like you. Is that's why he likes those picks, too. And, like, a lot yep. of people will say that he's not very analytical when, in fact, he actually created, like, he was a godfather of football analytics when he did that, when he, the nickel defense, like, Belichick is actually, he's done a lot. 
He's done a ton. I think one there was a comment there that I can't wait to read the Belichick memoir, and I just can't wait to see what other things he influenced that we just don't know about yet because he's not a big bragger. You know, like what else should he be bragging about that that we don't know quite yet? I mean, there's got to be a ton of things that he's the godfather of. Um, all right, speaking of Bill, let's let's stay on that topic. Uh, who gets picked also, you know, who's the GM, who's the head coach, where does Bill Belichick head coach could influence some of this draft discussion. Um, there was, I put a poll out there earlier. I'll have to look at it while I ramble here, but um, to, to basically asking like, where do you think Bill Belichick's going to end up in his next destination as Patriots fans are kind of all, you know, I think interested in that. And all right, I'm looking at it now that got 73 votes so far and it's leaning 68% on the Falcons. And I'm, that doesn't surprise me just because he took an interview, whether the interview was in person on that yacht or he was zooming on that yacht. He took an interview on the yacht uh, with the Falcons. Do you think he's going to the Falcons? Do you have any thoughts on where Belichick's going next? Uh, yeah, Lombardi has mentioned that too with the Falcons, and he said that for like a couple weeks now. Um, and But I've always heard that Bill is not a West Coast guy. He's always been an East Coast guy, and it would be very tough to get Bill out to the West Coast. So I think – we're probably going to be able to mark the chargers off with bill. And so Mm. that really leaves, I think, unless there's another surprise team, because we don't know who else is going to be fired. Who's going to have, who's going to have a year left that gets fired early because bill maybe hints that he would maybe go there. But Mm. right now I think it's Cowboys Falcons and like the Falcons have a lot of ammo. Obviously bill gets to go there and kind of, if it works out for bill, you can say, wow, Bill just changed his franchise. It doesn't work out. They were the Falcons 28 to three. Like there's really, there's really not much to hurt his legacy because whereas like if he, if he goes to the Cowboys, I can definitely see a world where the local media is on him in Dallas every day. If they're not very good, just like they were are with McCarthy and just like they are with everyone else in Dallas. That's it's like Boston. It's like huge media market. Whereas the Fal- maybe the Falcons are just like happy, happy to have them. But I've also had preliminary talks with not very many Falcons fans, and I've seen them on Twitter with that. With that's like no reason to think that's why most people think right. But a lot of these fans are like, we don't want Belichick, blah blah blah. But so I don't know. I think he goes to the Falcons. I think he just. I think he likes the East Coast. You know, it's close to down south. I think it's going to be hard to get him out West Coast. He's going to go. He's going to go to the Falcons. They're going to be like, okay, Bill, show us the way. Like, do what you got to do. Whereas it, that's a little bit different with the Cowboys, right? They have a little bit different structure. So I think he just goes to the Falcons, and the division is like slightly easier, right? That's I think the biggest sell of the Falcons is that he can go there and, and actually win if he, you know, changes a few things here and there. Um, one thing that the Falcons would need to do is completely change their org structure. Uh, they don't have the coach run the entire team. They would need to uh, change their whole front office because that is how they run their team. Um, so that would be interesting to see who reports to who and because they just they just fired their coach. And at that press conference, Arthur Blank was basically letting everyone know who reports to who and like the general manager and the, the head coach doesn't report to the general manager. He, like goes straight to like the pr- player of ops. I don't know. It was a weird setup, in my opinion. And uh, so it would be interesting to see if Belichick entered in what they what they would change that all to. Um, and then the Cowboys is the other option, right, that we were discussing. And Jerry Jones loves to mingle in everyone's business. But I think he's pissed. I think he's at his wit's end um, and is wouldn't mind relinquishing control if it was to Belichick. Like he's not going to relinquish control to some scrub. Uh, but Belichick walks in the building. He might. And, you know, owners. Jerry Jones, Kraft, I don't know. There might be a little feud there. There might be a little reason for Belichick to want to go play for or play for, coach for Jerry Jones. Um, And you're thinking of the ownership again. Arthur Blank, Jerry Jones, Robert Kraft. Robert Kraft kind of pissed Belichick off or vice versa, whatever. There was a mutual pissing of off. Um, Jerry Jones is not a bullshitter. He's going to come straight to your face and tell you about it. He's not going to call you like some great wise man and, and shit on you behind your back. Um, which maybe Belichick sees as an attractive thing. Like I just got dumped on by, you know, I'm great. And I was getting shit on by Robert freaking Kraft. Um, I'm not here for that. I'd rather deal with a guy who's straight up with me, like Jerry Jones. But if you go with Arthur Blank, it's kind of like a little bit crafty, Um, you know, more willing to shit on you behind your back and not really be honest with you. So you never really know um, how much like the environment of the business comes into play versus, uh, you know, just what does the team roster look like and what, how, 
could he win easily? Like those are things that fans probably consider, but you know, like how am I going to be treated at work? Um, that is something that like when you go to get a job, like you consider like the salary, how you're like the environment and stuff. Um, very rarely, like how's your IT department? Um, you know what I mean? So like, sometimes it's just about how you're going to feel showing up to work each day. And maybe that's the reason why the charges are off the list. Like you said, maybe he just doesn't want to go to the West coast. And it's just as simple as that. Um, and I just want to be on the East coast. So I'm going to eliminate the teams that aren't on the East coast. Luckily the other teams that are thrown out there, Panthers, Titans, Eagles, kind of all East coast teams. So there's lots of options on the East coast for him if he does want to stay on the East coast. Um, but it is going to be interesting if he takes that, um, takes that record from Shula, uh, and then Kraft will basically been responsible for ushering Brady out, who won a Super Bowl as a Buccaneer, and then ushering Belichick out, who uh, broke a wins record. And God forbid he wins a Super Bowl before we win one as a Patriots. And, and Kraft, Kraft's view uh, might shift completely, and his hopes on the, on the Hall of Fame. I, you know, I, I think he's probably he could get in anyway, but there's a long list ahead of him. But ex- if you usher out Brady and Belichick and have them have success elsewhere, that that's a stain on your record. Absolutely. I mean, no matter what what you want to say, like Kraft is the boss of the boss, and he can keep. He could have kept Brady if he wanted to. If you remember what Brady's agent said, asked Mister Kraft, and if you heard Devin McCourty when he talked about how they did their deals, Bill would always say, "Well, I'd like to do this. Let's go talk to Kraft." So, like he does, he's the owner. Like he does sign the checks. So, like as you just said. He is. He will be known as the owner that had all the all the success with Bill and Brady, and both of them left, and he let it happen, and or made it happen, made sure of it to happen. So, like that's gonna be like, I I think that's crazy, but that's gonna be his legacy. So, that's craft for you. I mean, I've I've really been irritated with the, like the way that Kraft has handled all this stuff, especially when it comes to Mac and Brady, like. Kraft is ready to step in and no, you won't trade Mac and we're going to hire Bill O'Brien. But for Brady, like he just, he just stood pat and like let Bill run the show. Maybe he's thinking like, I just learned my lesson with Brady. I can see that too. But at the same time, I think it's like kind of ridiculous that Kraft is just able to pick and choose like when, like when he does things and like it's been shown that he was wrong for not stepping in. You're right. He picks and chooses. I just wrote down pick and choose. I didn't want to forget that you said that. And he, you're right. He like sometimes he'll come in and support the player. Sometimes he comes in and supports the coach. Sometimes he comes in and supports someone else or the offensive coordinator or whoever. It just seems like he picks and chooses. And sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong. And it's like you can't pick and choose and sometimes be right and sometimes be wrong. If you're going to pick your spots, you kind of have to nail it, in my opinion. You have to know what the F you're doing. Right. And I he messed up a couple of these, like you said. To, in, when it was time to either keep Brady or keep Bill, Kraft ultimately went with Bill because Brady left. Um, whereas Brady wanted a contract through like the age of 45, and Belichick had been making the case that quarterbacks in their late 30s fall off. So never mind mid 40s. Um, so, and Kraft ultimately had a pay or not pay. Um, so it is interesting to see or, or to hear that quote pick and choose. That's exactly what he does. Um, he decides sometimes when he wants to meddle and sometimes when he doesn't want to meddle. And I wonder how Mayo is going to handle that as a non-experienced coach and almost as like the controllable replacement. Like when Ma- when Kraft says, I really want a quarterback picked and Mayo's like, I really think we should run another chance with Mac Jones since he's under contract. Um, and I want to go Marvin Harrison. Like how does that conversation go? Does Mayo get to tell his drafters who he wants or, or is Kraft telling the people who draft who he wants to pick? And it, it is going to be interesting what he picks and what he chooses moving forward with a new structure in place, uh, the new structure being, you know, Mayo controllable versus Bill Belichick not controllable or delegated oh, yeah. non-control, you know? Yeah, and it's not even that. It's even more difficult for that because you're fighting an uphill battle because look what Kraft did with his new documentary, right? He, he made this new documentary and was able to spin the narrative so that after he got rid of Bill, all oh, that documentary so just happens to come out next month. Oh, that's funny. So now he's able to just, you know, do this documentary and sit back in his chair and look like a, like a feeble old man and just, I was trying to keep it together as best as I could. And he gets to say his side of the shit. Where, you know, Bill and Brady are on there, but at the end of the day, it is Kraft's documentary. So it is fun in the way that Kraft likes. Obviously, you, we saw what Curran's been doing. We saw what everyone else has been doing. Like, Kraft is going to be able to spin the media the way he was. And like, 
I don't know. Maybe you could say maybe Gar Romeo can do that because Curran's his buddy now, but it's going to be very difficult um, for like a local beat reporter to just, like take the side of Gerard Mayo over Robert Kraft. It is interesting too that that documentary is a little bit of a like, hey, why am I not in the Hall of Fame? Like, look what I've done as Robert Kraft. Aren't I the man? Um, and, you know, Kraft always has this, uh, why is Jerry Jones in the Hall of Fame? You know, basically saying, why am I not in the Hall of Fame? Like, he has this, like, self-image thing that's super important to him. And so you're right. If any any sort of criticism comes out from a local media, he's not going to take that well. And it might be the end of you getting any information. Like, you have to play your cards right in the media, too. Who you piss off, who you don't, what you report, what you don't report, what sources you trust versus not. I can't imagine being in in that world of, like, do I report this? It's bad about this person that I know that I go to work to every day, but that's my job is to report this. That's got to be a tough, a tough battle to kind of pick mentally for your own. If you're a reporter, a local beat reporter, especially moving forward, Belichick had a horrible relationship. So it was kind of, I don't know. No, I wouldn't say it. Maybe it was a horrible relationship, but basically he didn't give him anything. And Mayo seems more open as a, as a coach. So that would be interesting to hear more openness from your head coach at press conferences on thoughts about game plans so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and by the way, if I were Robert Kraft, I would think the exact same thing. I would be sitting there thinking, why am I not in the hall of fame? So I can't blame him for thinking this because this is exactly the way I and most other people would think too. And just to give Kraft, like we'll throw him another bone because we just kind of like dissed him for 20 straight minutes. Fair. I hear a lot of people talking like Kraft is cheap. Kraft is this. Everyone that's my friend that's listening to this. If I ever pay $250 million for something and you call me cheap, never talk to me ever again. By the yeah. way. <laughs> so I think that's relative though, right? Like when you're below the cap and people are like, why didn't you spend that, that cap money? Uh, you know, some people yeah, don't realize that's, that's, that's actual really, really dollars. Those are, that's real money that he gets to keep if he doesn't spend it. You know what I mean? Like these are, he, this is the paycheck that he writes to his employees. This is a company that he runs at the end of the day. So your overall employee budget uh, is how you look at it. Not who cares what the rest of the league does or the other companies do. This is what my company does. I think that's how Kraft looks at it a little bit, you know, how he sets up his org structure and everything like that. This is just how I run my company. And you're right. He's not, not necessarily cheap, uh, but people just wish I think he balled out a little bit more. And you never know if that was Belichick trying to, get the best value for everything so he could be called the genius or if it was Kraft saying no no you don't have that money to spend so Belichick being constrained and again that's why I can't wait for the memoir to figure out exactly you know where everyone lied and what what was true versus what people think but you're right we did take a a dump on Kraft for a little bit uh I think he belongs in the hall of fame too he just as much as Brady belongs in the hall of fame and Belichick belongs in the hall of fame like he's third He's third probably person on that list that was stayed through the entire tenure and had a pivotal role. I know he never put a jersey on, but you know, when you are the CEO of a company and your company's wildly successful, I think you get some credit for that. Yeah, and I'll, I totally agree with you. I just want to also say, I don't think we're going to hear their side of the story with Brady and Bill. Like, we still really haven't heard the intricate details of Brady. We've heard him talk a little bit, right? But we know, we all know that Brady hasn't, he hasn't been completely forthgoing with everything. Because guess what? He and Bill, they're, at the end of the day, they're kind men. Like, if you if you hear about the relationships between people with Bill and Brady, like, they're not the type of guys who just, like, spill it all out there and say, well, crap did this and brady did this and bill did this like i don't really think that we're ever gonna get that from bill especially if you saw his last conference like his very last press conference with the patriots it's clear that he's gonna come back it's clear that he's they're gonna like build a statue with him and brady they'll like they're gonna he's gonna have his own thing there he's a patriot forever as he just said I don't think we're ever going to hear those stories. We The stuff may leak here and there, but I think those guys have too much class and it's only going to be years and years and down the road and maybe till they're even gone before we even start to hear the stories of stuff like that from the people that may have been around them. I don't think we, while they're around, I don't think we hear any of that stuff. I'll be patient. I'll hang in there. I don't care if I'm I agree. Old. I'll be there. I'll. I mean, I'll still be posting the Bill Belichick intro meme, and whenever I hear yeah. a rumor about Bill and Brady or Bill and Kraft, but I'm just saying those guys have a lot of a lot of class, and I I just don't see them doing it. You know, and I respect them for that. You know, just, you know, not spilling the beans on on dirty laundry and just keeping it between themselves. If ultimately we don't hear anything, it, 
that would be my that would be my takeaways. You know, they just have the utmost respect for each other, and that and that is a message that you can take away if you, if there's no dirty laundry, right? They all just had respect, and they're not going to go out there. And there's obviously like times, like even if you think of like your relationship with your best friends or your close circle, like you probably had some beef with at some point, right? You probably had disagreements, arguments, fights at some point, and especially if you had to like work together on a, in a close capacity, there's definitely going to be butting of heads, right? You can't always agree, so. I just think that that's what happened at work. But ultimately, when they like go home from work and they get in their car and they're driving home, they love each other. And I mean that not in like a, you know, like they love each other. Like they actually have a mutual love for each other and not just like, oh, yeah, I appreciate him as a coworker. Like, no, I think that they consider each other quite close to family. Um, and I think it's t- some years of separation might even do them good because there's a little hostility, like when Brady came back for opening day and the family didn't talk to Belichick. It's like, Hopefully one day that, you know, they get over that and like the family will talk to Belichick. But, uh, you know, for now, it is what it is. Um, And the Patriots, the state of the Patriots uh, is what it is. And there's just so much to unfold that uh, I feel like this is just a soap opera. And I love watching the day to day like Patriots. I I think drama is a good word for it because right because we don't know what's going to happen. And. The, and like you're on the edge of your seat that's kind of what drama is so I, i'm here for it I don't, I don't know about you oh uh, yeah of course i always am that's always how i've been and i and that's i think one thing that has always made me stand out from uh, my peers is that i don't get really too entrenched with the local stuff like should malik cunningham be starting over blah 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 like who, yeah, no, I'm out who on cares that. i was so and, out on that discussion <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I like me, I always listen to the national stuff. And so I started catching on to like, what's what's national stories or what's national news. Like if you look at my Twitter, you look at my highlights, I'm, I'm not here to brag, but I just kind of know what large audience is like. And it's not that it's not that little stuff. Right. And this but this drama that we've had that we saw for the past 20 some years has been it will never be ever replicated the way things happen, the intricacies, how quiet Bill was about everything. Same with Brady too, right? There's so many stories. This has been the most interesting, entertaining thing. And the Patriots really, for all those years, were not particularly an entertaining team to watch for most NFL fans. They'll tell you that. Like they didn't enjoy watching the Patriots. Like, whereas um, some other teams that are particularly popular, like they watched the Patriots because they hated them. And now Mm -hmm we transition to the Patriots where if they don't have Brady and Bill and um, we're in grave danger. And I say we're like, I'm not the Patriots, but like we're as in as fans, we're in grave danger of watching a team that is particularly um, not good to watch and unentertaining for the entire NFL. And you saw us get flexed. Uh, you saw the Patriots get flexed out of these games. And I know that's because they're not very good, but the Patriots are, could possibly be aligning for this, then this is like the cycle of an NFL team. You don't just, you aren't just historically great for 20 some years. And then it's like, Oh, we're just great again. Like there's a good chance that this, they become particularly boring and we have nothing to talk about, which some people are like, Oh, who cares? Like, but I like, I like talking about interesting stuff. And I like the Patriots to be interesting because it gives my friends and I things to talk about online and with each other. Whereas if the Patriots are bad and uninteresting, then I'm like, it's October and we're already talking about the next quarterback. Like when I have a lot of friends that are, I have friends that are Belichick guys, I have friends that are Brady guys, I have friends that appreciate them both. My pro, and I'm known as like one of the most pro Brady guys in the state of NFL Twitter, right? Brady's like one of my tweets. But I will say after Bill left, all my Brady friends were like, oh, yes, let's go. Like, Bill's gone. Brady won. I'm like, guys, you don't understand. It might get so – this is might just get even worse than we could ever expect it. And, like, I'm not fully ready to, like, log online in September and be like – yeah, um, the Patriots could probably get another quarterback. Like, this is the life of fandom as of a bad NFL team. And when you get rid of that brain drain, like we talked about, we're like you're at severe risk for this. So the counter to all these people leaving and jumping up and down because Bill is gone, it's like, be careful what you wish for. Perhaps it isn't that great after all. Maybe it could be. I'm just saying I wasn't jumping for joy, and I'm a Brady guy, but I wasn't like, yes, Bill is gone. Let's go. I was like, wow, like this is the end of an era. This stinks, and 
the last juice we like could squeeze out of the Patriots being interesting to like all of my like friends who aren't Patriots fans is is Bill gonna leave? And that may be the last time they ever asked me about the Patriots ever again in my lifetime. That's a scary thought. <laughs> it's you're not wrong. I, I'm just a fan of the team, man. Like I'm not happy that they had to fire their coach. I'm not happy that their quarterback left. Like I'm a fan of the team and. Like, as soon as Brady started wearing a different team's jersey, like, obviously, I love Tom Brady. I love Tom. I'm wearing his jersey right freaking now. You know what I mean? I love Tom Brady. But when he was on the other team, it was like, all right, so now who do I root for? Tell me who to root for, team. Who's your quarterback? Like, I, I need my assignment as a fan. Like, I'm, I'm a team person. So, you know, before Belichick got dismissed, before they broke up, I don't even want to use the word fired because it feels like they broke up. Before they broke up, like, I was, you know, Belichick's the coach. Belichick's great. Belichick has every reason to coach again next year. Didn't happen. Belichick got dismissed. They brought in Mayo. And now I'm like, I can see the light. I can see how this could be good. You know, I, as much as I liked Belichick at the time, but now you're telling me my assignment is Mayo. Mayo is my head coach. What do I like about him? There's some positives to, to gleam in on. Am I going to be critical? Hell yeah. It's like half of what I do is be critical. But the other half is what's the light at the end of the tunnel? What are they seeing in, in the organization that they're getting excited about all these changes? You know, they're excited. Why can't I be too? So um, I think that, you know, I'm going to be a fan until the day that I die. Whatever they tell me to root for is probably what I'll be rooting for. Uh, meaning like who's on the field. That's what they tell me to root for is the product that they're putting out there. They're confident and I'll be confident in it too. And if it needs to be assessed, like Mac Jones, I was, all right, beginning of the season, let's go, Mac Jones. It, you had your your bad offensive coordinators because they weren't really offensive coordinators. You get another chance. And then he starts out like, what, one in five or whatever the abysmal start was. And it's like, all right, now it's time to be critical. Get him out of here. Bring me something else in so that I can be a fan of that because I can't can't get on board with this with this product anymore. And we were talking about are the Patriots interesting again? Is their product? And I think their product is exciting, right? There's something, there's a fresh face in town. There's things to look forward to. Mayo's young. Can he bring in some other players that, uh, you know, want to play for a young coach that is, you know, going through this, this transition period? Is some former players going to want to come coach with them or some coach is going to want to come coach with them like it's going to be interesting there's intrigue around the team whereas if bill was the coach you would have a lot of people arguing with each other about is he is it the right decision or not to stick with the old grumpy man and the same formula that doesn't win games and bill's style is outdated and defense doesn't win championships anymore and it would just be like argument city but there's like i don't know there's a reason to be hopeful over here now so i'm with it i'm with the hope yeah, and that's what I'm here for, right? I'm here to hype the Patriots up and hype the team up again and everything we have. Like, people made fun of me last August for hyping up Demario Douglas. Ended up being a W. He's a good player. But that's what I always do for the rest of the time. Going to hype the Patriots up. Going to find some way to talk about them because this is the thing I love and I want other people to like the thing I love selfishly. So, oh, for the rest of the time, I will be here talking about the Patriots until they tell me to stop doing that. Right. <laughs> until I'm banned. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like we covered Bill Belichick and Mayo in, in depth. Is there anything that we missed that, uh, or any final thoughts that you have before um, we wrap up today? Uh, yes, I would like to fully say, because this conversation is going to be rampant, there was a, I will call it a Mayo Bowl in college where they, I can't remember what form of Mayo, I'm not really formed with like Mayo, and th- like where they dumped mayonnaise on this coach after a game when he won. First of all, um, I'm not happy with the fact that Mayo is actually going to be hyped around everything I like because I cannot stand Mayo. I hate Mayo oh, as a condiment. No, I don't. Oh. Yes, I don't like Mayo as a condiment. I don't like mustard as a condiment. Like I'm a like I am a very simple guy. Give me barbecue sauce and ketchup, me and too. that's literally it. Make fun of me all you want. I don't like all the Mayo memes. So I'm gonna do my best for the rest of time to absolutely never say the word Mayo. I will just call him Coach Gerard because I'm I'm like literally I hate Mayo this much, man. Like I really do hate Mayo this much. Yeah, I'm not a, a, a condiment person either or a mayo person either, but I just, I was, you said they dumped mayo all over a person's head and I Googled it and I'm disgusted now too. Uh, it, disgusting. On. I'm disgusting. Absolutely I, disgusting. I, I, I hope this doesn't, this doesn't bother you then. Hold on. What, what's the <laughs> right link? 
It's Duke's oh, okay. mayonnaise. Yes, Gina just said it in the chat. It's Duke's, Duke's mayonnaise and dumping all over yeah, someone. Yeah. Like if if you dump mayonnaise all over me, yeah. like we're fighting for sure. Oh yeah, I just pulled up a picture on it for those of you watching. Uh, this guy got a bunch of mayo. He had like sit in a chair, got dumped all over. It was Duke's. Yeah, oh, that's disgusting. Uh, please don't make that part of. Uh, oh yeah, please don't please don't make that part of patriot culture. The 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 mayonnaise as an actual condiment being dumped on someone or, or involved at all i think he did though mayo did do an ad spot with a mayonnaise company um oh. well i know he had home. some like seasoned mayos yeah he had some like back in the day he had seasoned he mayos yeah but that was to stop um wasted food right so like that company was like trying to raise awareness that like a lot of people waste food in their fridge and throw it away and that this was supposed to be like they were trying to raise awareness or something positive while advertising their product and using mayo's last name as as a pun so um yeah but i'm out i'm out on mayo uh um, that's I'm, gonna be mayo all of you is sicken me you all sicken me eating this disgusting mayonnaise on everything that's flavorless nonsense eat ranch like a real man or don't Ooh, eat ranch. anything at all no mayo season yeah. no seasoning just globs of disgustingness like i'll take whatever i don't care i'm not eating so mayonnaise and this is disgusting I'm out on mustard, you said, but do you like honey mustard? No, I'm like, I'm, I'm in on honey mustard. From That's where we, I'll, yeah. I will just say to everyone, I know this is TMI before we go, but like I was in a restaurant when I was a young kid and don't ask me how this even happened, but I was in a restaurant. There was a fruit, like a fruit cake. Everyone knows what a fruit cake is. Mm hmm. And so I'm, I'm a young kid. I'm like, oh, fruitcake, cool. So I grabbed the fruitcake. So there's like mayonnaise on this fruitcake. So I eat it. It's the first time I've ever had mayonnaise, right? That's the last time I ever had mayonnaise knowingly because I puked everywhere. And so every ever since then, I've had this war and vendetta against mayonnaise. So I will fully go online and have a rant every single month. If we have to be, if we have to discuss all this mayonnaise all the time, I'm done. I'm done with everything. I'll be, I'll yeah, boycott I, saying uh, it's just Coach Gerard from now on. This is disgusting. Yeah, we can go with that. I'll roll with that, Gerard. Yeah, I had a similar <laughs> experience with Cheez Its. I was left in front of a box of Cheez Its as a child, ate the whole thing, threw the whole thing up, and ever since then, never had touched. And if I smell a cheese, it I get nauseous. So I understand completely the the traumatic experience that you've had and how it how it affects your adulthood <laughs> today. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry for going on the rant about that, but I do appreciate you having me on the podcast. I know I've told you before, but I hope you keep doing your podcast, and I'll be happy to come on every once in a while if you do so choose to have me back because, you know, most hated. No, nah, you're not hated here. Uh, it's all love over here, especially when it's when it's all positive, right? Like it just takes on the on the Patriots. So we really can't get all heated up. That's one thing that I want to go and do a PSA, if I if I may. Um, you know, I'm down for a great conversation. I'm down to debate. I'm down to furiously argue uh, against anybody, really. Um, you know, especially if if you think you're right and I think I'm right, let's debate. Um, but let's not name call, right? I've noticed that on Twitter that some people call other people idiots or morons or just it goes way worse than that. Um, keeping a PC, but like have as soon as you start using those insults, it's like, oh, you're not mature enough to make actual points. You're just getting angry that your actual points are being made against you. It's basically like, shut the fuck up. You don't really have anything good to say. So, you know, come at let's have the debates in these in this Twitter space in, in a healthy, a healthy way where we're just making solid points. And if anyone's getting worked up, it's because there's such solid points being made. No name calling. Keep it positive. Keep the vibe strong. Um, Bryson, thank you for joining me again. Um, like I said, first repeat host. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and anybody else that really wants to talk Patriots, I uh, have a little lineup going for the next couple of weeks. We're going to be bringing on some Twitter people. Um, you know, the Twitter community is hot and they have great things to say. So let's talk about it on this podcast. Uh, that's this is the forum for you all to speak. You want to hop on and talk Pats? I'll be here. Uh, if you can put up with me, you can come over here and talk Patriots any old time. We'll go live for the Twitter community and the YouTube community. And as we grow, I'm sure there'll be a bigger community, too. So I appreciate Bryson, you stepping in, um, being a guest. Uh Please read his writings uh, and, and join his spaces. I'll pop in every once in a while and um, take a listen. I need to I need to turn into a speaker more often, but I, I often kind of am just impulsively joining and, and exiting. So I don't want to be rude and only stay for five minutes or whatever if I'm a speaker. But I plan to be in there. I appreciate for you being in here. And I think both of us can agree. Uh, go Pats. I agree, buddy. Thank you very much. And go Patriots. Peace.